This is Remember Guns. 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 Listen, the Bears are what we thought they were. They're, they're what we thought they were. We played them in preseason. Who the hell takes the third game of the preseason like it's f- We played them in the third game. Everybody played third quarters. The Bears are who we thought they were. And that's why we took the damn field. Now, if you want to crown them, then crown their ass. But they are who we thought they were. And we let them remember that guy, the show where we mind our memories for notes and nostalgia about peripheral players past and present. Hey there, folks. I am who you thought I was, which is one of your hosts, James. I'm not who you thought I was. Just kidding. I am Diaz. But we have the cause of that epic rant by Dennis Green with his tremendous return skills for the Chicago Bears. Please introduce yourself, our special guest. God, I wish I was that good. You know, I, I'm definitely not uh, any Hall of Fame level return man, but I am the very special guest, Xavier. Uh, Devin Hester was so good. Here is the question that I will pose to the two of you, since I've watched this interview to memorize that Canes a couple times. Who is the Bears player whose name is actually said in the question right before that rant? Did Sexy Rexy? It is Sexy Rex Grossman. Love the, that. Fighting an a intense battle with Trent Dilfer for worst quarterback to ever make a Super Bowl since 2000. Sexy Rexy loves the fucking deep ball. I, I don't know what else. That, that, that was my first uh, favorite like internet meme that I can remember. Was It wasn't Rex Grossman, but there were Rax Grisman comments. <laughs> <laughs> where it was like, Rax Grisman sees the, the open receiver in the flat five yards downfield does he throw it to him no Rax Grisman throws it 200 yards into the second level of the stadium and kills an innocent child Rax Grisman walks to the sideline knowing that he has the strongest arm in the whole stadium and everybody's in awe of him sexy Rexy Grossman loves the deep ball chicks love the deep ball you know what I love Diaz whatever it is that is making memories for you right now well the world cup has been fantastic I'm sure Xavier's gonna have a lot more to say about that as we record, an incredible day in Group E, Japan, or as I was watching it, Japon, uh, because I do watch all of these games on Telemundo, which is the preferred viewing experience, especially if you speak Spanish. And even if you do not speak Spanish, I just think it's a better experience overall. But I digress. The World Cup's been incredible. What a win by Japan today to win Group E a group that had Spain and Germany in it and now sees Germany going home. An incredible upset. A win with 17 possession percentage. Yeah, it was great. Possession. It was so fun. It was great the, to watch. The record lowest in a World Cup game for a winner. Well, and the margin by which Japan kept the ball in in the lead-up to their second goal is, like, literally down to, like, decimals and fractions of a centimeter or an inch or whatever your preferred measurement system is if it went like one blade of grass further it would have been ruled out remarkable just how close that came to actually being out and you know props to the refs for calling that correctly and allowing the play to continue and allowing japan to pull off one of the upsets of the tournament in a tournament that's been full of them We've seen Saudi Arabia beat Argentina. So many upsets to choose from. I mean, and this World Cup has been just amazing from the perspective that it's just the last two groups are finishing up group play tomorrow, correct? Yep. So thus far, of those 24 teams that have taken the field on the final day, 22 of them had a chance to advance if circumstances broke their way which has just led to some incredible soccer. So, I mean, the World Cup has been amazing. Shout out Christian Pulisic. He claims that it was not his testicles that were injured on that play, but it is my personal canon that Christian Pulisic laid his testicles on the line for his country in order to secure the advancement of the United (laughs) States into the knockout round. What an incredible sacrifice. And I just am in awe of his dedication to both country and team. The World Cup's been amazing. I'm sure Xavier will elaborate a little further on that, but at least for 
myself. I've, I've had some incredible memories made. It's been so good. It's been fantastic. But yeah. I can ramble a lot, so James, I think it might be best. What is big memories for you? Well, I got, I got three for you right now. First off, I just want to thank Joey Votto for clearly getting very into the butt-buzzing scandal this year. It seems to have inspired him to join a chess tournament in the Cincinnati area. He did show up looking like a knockoff brand version of Oscar Isaac with his incredibly bushy beard, suspenders, tie, and all that. I'm about. Oh my God, Joey that's Votto's, fantastic. He's kind of hot in it. I'm not going to lie. The suspenders. It's incredible. And that was about the highlight because he did make it clear that he lost to a nine year old in one of his opening rounds. So keep at it, Joey. If you are as attentive to your skill in chess as you are to your skill in baseball, I'm sure eventually you'll be advancing further. I, I have some bad news for the two of you. We unfortunately do got to give it to Celtics fans. No. Because last night, no, we do have to give it to Celtics fans this one time. Because last night, that would have been November 30th, in a game between the Celtics and the Heat, it was revealed that Prince William, a product of inbreeding from the English Isle, came over here with his wife, Kate, to attend a basketball game. And they were rained down with USA chants when they were shown on the big screen. Now, this is okay because it's World Cup. We're allowed to kind of be in that zone right now. We may find ourselves playing England again, and I'm sure that we will show those two up at that time. But I'm just personally glad that for once, we did not give them any undue praise and adulation that they did not deserve. I just want to chime in and say, the USA chant is very, very powerful. And Xavier and I are in the rare circumstance of having been born and raised and lived in this country. However having been on the receiving end of a USA chant yep. when we watched the World Baseball Classic final between USA and Puerto Rico. Xavier, myself, and our dear friend Jose, we all went out to a bar on Temple's campus in support of Puerto Rico. And, and nobody at the bar has any clue that this game is happening. Until they see that there's these three fuckers in Puerto Rico garb, and as the USA lead continues to grow... We are assailed with a USA chant. I just need to say, if you are an outsider in that moment, that shit cuts deep. It is so effective at making you feel like a piece of shit. I've experienced that in my life. When Yankees fans come to someone else's stadium (laughs) and drown out the home fans with let's go Yankees. No, that is the exact feeling. And like, this is my place. This isn't supposed to be happening right now. I'm just here to, like, watch my team, play baseball, and cheer for them. And now I got this whole bar full of assholes chanting at me. Like, felt very hostile. But to your point, yes, James, a USA chant is a great way to make outsiders feel like the outsiders that they are. We do, unfortunately, got a hand it to them. The, the Celtics and Heat fans had that tied-together green and red bandana moment. Speaking, though, of college life, I'm glad that you you touched on that because I want to, for my last bit, just take a moment to acknowledge the brilliant editors at the University Daily Kansan. They are tonight, December 1st, in a game against Seton Hall, handing out free copies of their most recent publication, which is a full front page splash. It says, Big Energy. Big Energy is the headline. Why has Big Energy, the headline, grabbed me so? Well, it is Big inserted picture of one of their players energy that is how the front page reads that player oh, no. is last year's gatorade high school national player of the year wearing number four just turned 19 shooting guard and small forward grady dick fantastic name well done university of daily kansan good job big energy indeed he missed the trick by not being number 69 it would have been just too powerful He's probably going to be a one and done. Like, he is a a big deal. We will be talking about Mr. Dick, I'm sure, sometime soon. And he should wear Uh, 69. (laughs) He he should, but for now, that's enough dicking around. Like we said, Xavier, you've got a lot of stuff to ramble about. Why don't you go ahead and start rambling? Okay, so there has been a lot of sports going on. So first, I want to give a shout out to Troy Taylor in the Sacramento State Hornets football team. Troy Taylor is their head coach. Used to be a member of the New York Jets. Was a quarterback there for about a year in the early 90s. From Sacramento, went back home after his career ended, and was a coach at Cal, and then a high school coach for 
a very long time over in Sacramento before moving to Eastern Washington, where he was the offensive coordinator during Cooper Cup's uh, senior season, where he had 1,700 yards receiving and 17 touchdowns, and Eastern Washington made it to the FCS semifinals. After this one single season where his team broke pretty much every single scoring record, he was the offensive coordinator for the Utah Utes for two seasons. And then he moved to Sacramento State, where he became the head coach of his hometown team. Sacramento State, bad team. They've been in the Big Sky Conference since 1996, had never won a conference championship, had never made the FCS playoffs. Troy Taylor has been there for three years. 2019, they win the Big Sky Championship, go to the playoffs. 2020, they did not feel the team because of COVID. 2021, they win the Big Sky Championship, go to the playoffs. 2022, they win the Big Sky Championship, go to the playoffs. This man is 3-for-3 in winning the conference title and making the playoffs with a team that had never done that before. There is nothing very special about it, but he has somehow found a way to just turn this random team from Sacramento into a world beater. And they are about to play Richmond this weekend in the second round of the FCS playoffs as the number two seed. The only team that is higher ranked than them is South Dakota State. Even North Dakota State is below them. Troy Taylor will probably have a very big job sometime soon, but it's really hard to do better than, yeah, my first three years as a head coach at the college level, I won conference championships every single year for a team that has never been good. He is what everyone thinks Matt Rule is. That that, that cuts, because I do love Matt Rule, but Troy Taylor... It didn't take him a couple of years to turn over oh, hold teams. On. Matt he did it in one season. Like, let's just say that real quick. Matt Rule's a lying piece of shit in everything that he has said in this University of Nebraska like press tour initially. That's eh, fine. I can't. I can't hate him. He's given me some of my greatest football moments of all time. He's a salesman, and you gotta sell, baby. You gotta sell. <laughs> but yeah, so eleven or no Sacramento State Hornets. I would love it if Troy Taylor could win a title for his hometown team before he goes to Cal or whatever next year, because I'm sure someone is going to give him a lot of money because he is a very good coach. Staying along the lines of obscure football things, have you ever heard of the Professional Football Researchers Association? Pro Football Focus, I know. And this seems like maybe vaguely related, but I have not heard of this specific institution. So the Professional Football Researchers Association is essentially an archive of football history. They are a group of researchers who take it upon themselves to preserve and, you know, spread football history. They have a semi-monthly magazine called The Coffin Corner. They produce books. They have some old-time stats that they keep. And one thing that they do that made me very excited is They have the Hall of Very Good. So every year they enshrine members into the Hall of Very Good to highlight the best players and coaches that are not yet inducted into the Hall of Fame, like Speck Sanders, who was a pro bowler for the New York Yanks in 1950. Is this the New York Yankees football team that shared a stadium with the New York Yankees baseball team? So there was a team called the Yankees, in the All-America Football Conference, and then there was a team called the New York Yanks in the NFL for two seasons. This is the type of history that the Professional Football Researchers Association preserves, and that makes me very happy. Last football thing that I wanted to bring up, and this is a local one, our boy, E.J. Warner, the son of Kurt Warner, and next legend of Temple football, was named the American Conference Rookie of the Year and also named to Pro Football Focus's all-true freshman team alongside a bunch of five-star prospects playing for LSU and Alabama and Texas. I just love seeing EJ's name up there, and I hope that no one tries to pay him a lot of money to leave Temple. We got a kid that threw for over 500 yards in a game, ate over 450 yards in another game, and... Almost set every Temple record despite not starting for the first 
quarter of this season. Please do not steal EJ Warner from us. We need him to be good again. Diaz, give him money to stay in Philly. Listen, I think his papa has more than enough money. I think that whole family's pretty set, personally. But you tell me what I need to do to keep EJ Warner as the starting quarterback for the Temple Owls. And within reason, I will do it. <laughs> you know, if he stays, I think there's a really good chance that Temple can be a bowl team next year. That offense was looking good. The defense, not so great, but not losing a lot of people. And I think they got something to build on if EJ stays. So fingers crossed he does. Last thing. Now it's time to get into World Cup corner. This World Cup's been... Wait, hold on. That's an incredible <clears throat> pun. Please continue. <laughs> it's been great. You know, I, I said to all of our listeners that I wanted to talk about all of the bad things beforehand because I was going to gush as a major soccer fan. And, and I am. But one of the things I do want to highlight is that during today's absolutely insane Germany versus Costa Rica game, there was the first ever all-female crew of referees. Stephanie Frappart of Germany was the main ref, along with Noiza Bach of Brazil and Karen Diaz of Mexico. All-female crew, first ever. Uh, and I think that's really awesome, continuing breaking barriers. There are six total female referees at the World Cup. Should be more. I mean, there's no reason. There's nothing special about being a guy that makes you a good referee, and I'm glad that FIFA's recognizing that. But good to see barriers being broken. And also, go USA. Go USA. Go USA. I hope we beat the Netherlands. If we do, I'm going to be talking about this again next week. I don't, we'll see what happens. It is important that refs of all gender be given the opportunity to still kind of discriminate against players and give them yellow cards that might affect whether or not they make it through to the World Cup. Glad it didn't oh, come down God, to I that. wish that it did. That would have been no, so I'm great. No, I'm pretty glad that, like, the white team didn't get ahead <laughs> of the Hispanic team in World Cup qualifying because they got slightly fewer yellow cards. Honestly, FIFA, if you're listening, this is what we need to redress. If the goal difference is equal and the goals for is equal, we don't need to go to yellow cards. Here's what we need to do. Take those two teams and let's just do a penalty shootout the next day. Why not? And do it. It'll take five minutes. It'll be so fucking quick. You can sell it pay-per-view. You can do whatever you want. Imagine the intrigue if group play closes and then people know, oh, the next morning, these two teams are going to have a penalty shootout to decide which one actually advances. Let's have it come down to that and not... To your point, James, the arbitrary decisions by an official that may or may not have certain biases that may or may not affect historically the it's been proven by the data against FIFA to have biases against non-white countries. Well, there you go. Just to set the record straight, there is absolutely evidence that that is the case historically and currently. So instead of continuing to be a bastion to uphold white supremacy, let's let it be settled on the pitch. Let's have a penalty shootout. If Listen, I'm fine with goal difference. I'm fine with goals for. If both of those are equal, penalty shootout. Or just do like, honestly, if we really want to get crazy, let's do like a one-on-one -on, -one on a whole pitch. One guy from each team, you do the kickoff, and you strategize as you'd like to see fit from there. One-on-one. -on -one. First one to put the ball on the goal, 120-yard pitch. Just the captains. Just the this captains. is our official pitch. <clears throat> this is actually reminding me of something. So I read a story on The Athletic the other day about how in 2026, when they're going to have 48 teams in the World Cup and they're still debating how they want to structure the group stage, if they do three-team groups, they are considering introducing penalty shootouts at the group stage in case of draws because... Otherwise, if you're only playing two games, it would be very easy for things, everything to end up tied and have to do weird drawing of lots. But the thing that they would do is do the penalty shootout before the game starts. Then it only comes into play if the game ends up tied. So you could know before the game starts that a tie is worse for you than for the other team. It's an interesting reversal. It's, it's like... That, that reminds me of, like, there's a Sam Hinkie quote that was like, oh, well, why do we play, like, the first quarter first and the fourth quarter last? Like, technically all possessions are the same. Which, 
I think is an insane thing to do and an insane thing to think. But it is the way that Sam Hinkie approaches that problem. Well, Xavier, speaking of things that remind you of other things, I have just been reminded that you are leading us off this week thanks to your successful litigation for Eric Snow last week. Yeah, so, you know, I had trouble trying to put my idea into, like, a coherent phrase, you know, talked about possible coattail hangers, and I think that a good way to phrase it would be front row seat for something special, for, for, for greatness. Maybe you were part of it, but okay. you, were, you, 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 you were really kind of watching and experiencing something fantastic, even if you weren't the main, you know, cause of it. I'm so excited that you've worded it this specific way for the first time right now. So please continue. <laughs> so with that being said, there was only one place that I could go based on what has been going on during the past couple of weeks. And I direct you, my two co-hosts, to what I'm currently wearing, which is a Espana track jacket from 2010 that my dad got me during the World Cup that somehow still fits despite being 12 years old. And I want to talk about one of the greatest dynasties of all time for international soccer, the Spanish national team of the late 2000s, early 2010s, and one specific player. During the 2010 World Cup final, this is, I don't know if you say a stat or a trivia thing that's been bandied about, but 10 of the 11 players on Spain's national team came from Barcelona or Real Madrid. The one guy who didn't was a left back who played for Villarreal, which was his fifth team on a long kind of journeyman career. Definitely the, the least star power e person on that team, especially when they would bring in Cesc Fabregas, Fernando Torres, Jesus Navas off the bench. I want to talk about Joan Captavila. So, Joan Abdevila. One more time. Joan Abdevila? Joan Captavila. Captavila. So it, it's, it's Catalonian. So it's, you, you might think it's like Juan Captavila or Captavilla. It's Joan Captavilla. Catalonian can get strange sometimes. I'm not going to pretend that I can speak it. Uh, but can I just, to your point, Xavier, I consider myself a fluent Spanish speaker and I can read Portuguese fluently and I can listen to Portuguese fluently and I stand zero chance of understanding Catalan. What a weird language it is. Catalan is weird and so is Basque. Basque has a lot of B's and X's, which I like, but but it's much, it's much harder to, uh, I am excited to hear about this 2010 World Cup where I was at a summer camp with like 20 Basque kids at the same time. I mean, there were there were definitely Basque uh, kids on that team because Xabi Alonso was on that team. But Juan Captavila was born in Tarrega, Spain on February 3rd, 1978. And he came up through the Espanol system. So Espanol is the second team in Barcelona that no one cares about or knows about because they're not Barcelona. There is a bit of a one-sided rivalry there where Espanyol hates Barcelona. Barcelona kind of hates Espanyol, but they have never been good, really, so no, they don't care that much, and they care much more about Real Madrid. He makes his debut for Espanyol in 98-99 season against Athletic Bilbao, the Basque team. And he's there for about a year. But then he gets a chance, and he goes to Atletico Madrid. Atletico Madrid are not that great at this point. If you watch La Liga now, you know that they are the third team after Barcelona and Real Madrid. And, you know, they've made Champions League finals. They've won La Liga under Cholo, Diego Simeone. But at this point, they're not great. Juan becomes their starting left back, still pretty young at this point. He's only 22. But Atletico suck. They're really (laughs) bad. And their whole board resigns because of financial issues. And then they get relegated. So now it's, do I stay in the second division or do I go somewhere else? So he leaves 
to go to Deportivo de la Coruña. Depor are not a La Liga team anymore. They are in like the third division of Spain at this point. Uh, well, currently, currently, <laughs> cur- currently, they're in the third division of Spain. Okay. Uh, but in the late 90s, early 2000s, they were good. They, they were called Super Depor. And they had a bunch of like strong Brazilian teams. And they won La Liga. And they were playing in the Champions League. And so he's joining a team that had just won the league the season before. So it's like, oh, this couldn't be better. I'm leaving a team that just got relegated to go to a team that just won. It takes him a little while to break into the squad. But he does become the first choice left back there and plays there for seven seasons. Problem is, they, they've already peaked by the time he's got there. He, he gets to see everyone parade around in, in, their, in their winner's medals because he's on the team when they get their medals the next year, but they don't win anything after that. Uh, they, they do get one Copa del Rey, but nothing special. But at the same time, he is doing okay for himself, and he has... Made some appearances for Spain, not a lot. Um, between 2002 and 2006, he only has seven caps for Spain. He's not doing much. Uh, he did he did get the chance to play for the under-23 squad at the Olympics in 2000 when they did lose to Diaz's favorite team, Cameroon, in a penalty shootout in the final. Is he like a reserve that's traveling with the main Spanish team, or he's like not even making the roster cut? He doesn't really make the roster that often, at least not when he's with Depor. There's a couple times he gets called up and he's a reserve, but he's not making it that often. I said, Depor aren't super great right now, and there's a lot of very good Spanish players coming through the system. He's still kind of there in the background. You know, that, that 2000 team, he got the silver on. That was a pretty good team, but the Indomitable Lions got them in the end. Now we get to 2007. He gets a chance to move to Villarreal, the Yellow Submarine, which is one of my favorite teams in Spain. So he moves on a three-year deal to this team. Is it through the song? Does that nickname predate the song, or did they really name themselves after the Beatles song? Ooh, that's an interesting, instant question. Like, well, so, I mean, Villarreal's been around since 1923. They're, they're a very old team, and I just know that they're the Yellow Submarine because they wear all yellow and they're like a lower profile team i don't know when they got that nickname to be totally honest i can tell you that happened in the 60s that is when they got the nickname because it was a highly popular song in spain during the 1960s while Villarreal was still a small club this is according to an article that was written on april 28th 2016 cited by wikipedia awesome thank you to wikipedia very much appreciate their their abilities there it was the b-side to eleanor rigby at that time was it really? Mm-hmm. This is when Villarreal was battling for promotion to Spain's third division. I'll stop reading this article now. <laughs> so Captain Vila joins Villarreal, and this Villarreal team is good. 07-08 team, they finished second. Only behind Real Madrid, but ahead of Barcelona and Atleti. He gets noticed by the Spanish coach, Vicente Del Bosque, more than he ever had previously. He gets called up to the squad for Euro 2008 and becomes the first choice left back for this Spanish squad that blitzes through the group stage. Uh, they win their first game against Russia 4-1 to with a hat trick from David Villa. They beat Sweden 2-1 to with goals from Fernando Torres and David Villa. And then they beat Greece 2-1. to Knockout stages, they take down Italy in penalties. And they take down Russia again in the semis. And then they get Germany in the final. So at this point, Spain had not won any sort of title in 44 years. They had been Euro champions at home in 1964 and had never done anything since. We think of like Spain now is considered you know one of the top teams. But up until this point, they really weren't. They were, they were very much a B-tier team with not really any, any strong history. They'd had good players, but there was never really any you know cohesion to their team. They were never really a, a threat in anything. And Germany was definitely the, the favorite here. Game starts out pretty cagey, 
And then Fernando Torres scores in the 33rd minute to give Spain a goal. Germany, they're pressing, they're pressing. They just can't get through the back line of Sergio Ramos at right back, Carlos Marchena at center back, Carlos Puyol as his partner, and Joan Captavila. And Spain wins their first title in 44 years. This Spanish team, they were pretty young at the time, but now we can say they were stacked. Their midfield was Xavi, Andres Iniesta, Cesc Fabregas, David Silva, with Fernando Torres up top. All of those guys are superstars, along with you know Ramos, Iker Casillas in goal, and Carlos Puyol. The only two people on that team you could say aren't are Carlos Marchena and Joan Captavila. But Spain gets their first title. This is the start of something special for Spain. They go on a streak of not losing for 35 straight games, which ties a record for all national teams at the time. It's since been broken by one, by Argentina, and by two, by Italy. But at the time, it was a record of 35, along with the Brazil teams of the early 90s. They're winning every game. The first loss that they have in three years is actually against the USA in the semifinals of the Confederations Cup in 2009, the tune-up for the 2010 South Africa World Cup. I remember that game like it was yesterday because fucking Josie Altador turns the defender, scores past Casillas, rips off his shirt, runs into the stands. USA wins 2-0, and then Michael Bradley also gets sent off right at the end, and then they lose in the final to Brazil after having been up 2-0 against Brazil. But uh, even during that Confederations Cup, Catavila sets up Fernando Torres uh, on a goal for Hattrick, Cesc Fabregas, makes team of the tournament even though Spain only finishes third. After this, you know, Spain's not done. Just losing one game, it's fine. It's not the end of the world. They're still you know, defending Euro champions. So what do they do next? They go to the World Cup in South Africa as favorites. And they lose the first game. They lose to Switzerland in a massive shock. Everything is, oh no, the sky is falling. If you lose your first game at the World Cup, your chances of advancing are about 16% because you you only have three chances and sometimes you could be eliminated after the second game depending on how results go your way. But thanks to a goal from Gelson Fernandez, they've lost 1-0. But the rest of their group is Chile and Honduras and Spain thinks, you know, we, we can still get through this. They switch some things up. Their back line pretty much stays the same. Sergio Ramos, Joan Captavila, Carlos Puyol, and a new center back pairing, Gerard Piquet, a.k.a. future Shakira's husband and then no longer Shakira's husband. I appreciate the Mr. Shakira so much because, as Xavier may know, in our Dynasty Football League, it is an IDP league, I have as safety Mr. Simone Biles, Jonathan Owens, currently a safety for the Houston Texans. He's a very good boyfriend to Simone Biles, and he's a very good tackle machine for the Houston Texans. So I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the my wife is more famous category of guy. <laughs> you know what? PK is an interesting character, and he should have just stayed married to Shakira. I think his legacy is starting to look pretty bad with some of his dealings that he's had since then. So should have stayed married to Shakira, but that's, that's neither here nor there. We're not here to talk about PK. This Spanish back line, they get things ship shape and shut out Honduras 2 0. Then they beat Chile 2 1 to advance the knockout stage. From there on, no one can touch them. They blank Portugal, they blank Paraguay, they blank Germany. And then we get to the final against the Netherlands. And this is where our story comes full circle. We have possibly the greatest team of all time on one side with players that I can make full arguments are top five in their position of all time, all up and down this squad. And then our friend, Joan Captavila. Very cagey game. I remember it pretty much like it was yesterday. There's a lot of slide tackles coming in, a lot of fouls. Robin Van Persie gets the first yellow card for fouling. Joan Captavila. And then a couple minutes later, Nigel De Jong kung fu kicks Xavi Alonso in the chest. 
in what is one of the greatest moments of what were you looking at, what were you thinking ever, in that, again, he kung fu kicks a player in the chest and does not get a red card. After that, everyone's like, okay, so it's going to be one of those games. The rest of the game is just fouls and fouls and misses and fouls. And it's a real defensive struggle until extra time when Andres Iniesta scores in the 116th minute to give Spain their first ever World Cup title and back-to-back major championships, the first European team to ever do that. And at left back is just our friend playing for a smaller team in Spain that no one really cares too much about, Joan Captavila. Unlike the rest of his compatriots who continue to play for Barcelona and Real Madrid after this, and will go on to then win a third major championship in a row, winning the 2012 Euros, this is pretty much where the story ends for, for Captavila. After 2011, he leaves Villarreal to go to Benfica uh, over in Portugal, where he plays for a year. Then he goes home to come back to Espanyol, where he plays for two years. Then he goes to India, where he goes to Northeast United FC of the Indian Super League. Okay, he's doing his eat, pray, love. And finishes last in the Indian Super League. Thankfully, there's no relegation there, so there's no punishment for that. But one year of playing for Northeast United was enough where he's like, okay, I'm going to come back to Europe. So he goes to uh, Liers in Belgium. That doesn't work out. So then he spends a couple games playing for FC Santa Coloma in Andorra. After that, he's like, okay, I, I, I think once you're playing in Andorra in soccer, it's probably time to, to hang it up. You have found the bottom. So he's like, all right, I'm just going to stop this here. He does actually play a couple games for the Catalonian national team because Catalonia does have their own team. They don't really play anyone real. They, play, they played a couple, but like... They played Jamaica this year in a friendly. They did beat Jamaica by six, which is not great for Jamaica. Yeah, so he played a bit, a little bit for the Catalonian team. But other than that, he was, he was pretty much done at that time. But Joan Captavila, he got to be there to witness probably the greatest Spanish team and be the one guy that no one super remembers from that dynasty. But he got to see some really fun stuff happen along the way. And I'm sure he made a lot of money and you know, enjoyed himself fully doing it. I did see that everyone said that he was probably the happiest guy on the team, which makes sense when sure. you're, when, when, yeah. when, when you're, uh, when, when you're that guy, you know, just, he, he did get a tattoo of the World Cup trophy on his calf with Johannesburg written underneath it for where they won it. But no matter what, even if he didn't win a ton during his club career, you can always say he was, he, he was a starter. He, he, he was there for, you know, one of the best national teams of all time. It's a starting 11. It's not a starting mm-hmm. 10 and then one more. It's an XI. X guy? X guy. X plus guy. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Uh, I'm glad you like that, Diaz. I like that a lot, Xavier. Starting X guy, that is the new official lineup denotation. And actually, as I look right here at our lineup, I'm, I'm scanning down. It looks like next up on deck is uh, Diaz, whoever you have ready for us this week. More than happy to try to deliver to that. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to borrow a page from X's book. I'm not going with the X guy, but what I am going with is last week in his successful litigation, Xavier pandered to me very well. <laughs> With Eric Snow. So James, what I'm going to attempt to do now for you is I'm going to pander to you as strongly as I possibly can. But it's not just for that effect. It's also for my own personal effect. To give you a little personal background, the, the first basketball jersey that I personally bought was a blue Sixers Andre Iguodala jersey. Uh, but the guy that I want to talk about is the second jersey that I bought. When we look back on the great Spurs dynasty that that spanned two decades, 
obviously, everybody remembers Tim Duncan. Everybody remembers Manu Ginobili. Everybody remembers Tony Parker. If I was to say, do you remember the defensive stopper on those teams? Most people's first thought is going to go to Kawhi Leonard. But the real ones know that Kawhi was only around for that last championship. But a man that was locking down your favorite team's point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, and even sometimes center, if it was necessary that night. Talking about number 12 in the programs, but number one in your heart, Bruce Bowen. Go on. <laughs> I, I'm glad that we I, all knew where Diaz was going for the, with that. I mean, it went, once I immediately said basketball when you said that, Xavier, I feel like there was... It, it, the, our collective consciousness kind of knew the way that I had to go with that. Before I elaborate further, I do want to, again, specify. The second jersey that I ever personally bought was a Bruce Bowen Spurs jersey because for my AAU teams and when I played in middle school, I wasn't the most offensively gifted player. But I knew... When I got on the court, I will always remember there was one time my coach put me in. I was coming off the bench, and there was this kid that was absolutely roasting us. He put me in, and he said, Justin, you're guarding number 12. If he scores one more point, I'm taking you out of the game. As long as he doesn't score, you get to stay in the game. I defended my ass off because my idol in that was Bruce Bowen. So... Allow me to go further in. Uh, Bruce Eric Bowen Jr. is the second of his name. Uh, <laughs> the junior. Okay. That, that is news to me, I will admit. He is a junior. He was born in uh, Merced, California. He had a bit of a rough childhood, to put it lightly. Uh, so obviously the son of Bruce Sr. and Dietra Campbell. He had a very problematic childhood as he grew up. Had to earn money to help keep the family afloat by being the local newspaper boy. So he's on the corner slinging newspapers. But the money that he earns did not go to providing food for the family or paying the bills. Uh, it went towards funding Bruce Sr.'s alcoholism. Bruce Jr. was on the corner selling papers just to be able to, to buy a couple 40 ounces for his dad. He only saw his dad from time to time. But his mother was also, unfortunately, addicted to drugs during his upbringing. It, it was so bad that at one point, Dietra sold the family television to support her crack habit. So it was an incredibly difficult upbringing for Bruce. He did have one good family member that looks out for him. Uh, his uncle Daryl is who he attributes to helping to provide a positive influence in his life and to keep him on the, the quote-unquote straight and narrow. But Bruce gives tremendous credit to Daryl for helping to keep him out of trouble. What he also gives credit to is, of course, the game of basketball. Basketball became an outlet for Bruce during this, this troubled upbringing, and he became a local star at West Fresno Edison High School. Resulting from that, he would get a scholarship offer to go play at Cal State Fullerton. In the course of his career, he plays in 101 games, averages 11.4 points and 5.8 rebounds. Good stats, certainly not superstar stats. His senior year, uh, he would bump those up a bit. He'd average 16.3 points, 6.5 boards, and 2.3 assists across just under 37 minutes a game, so... Pretty much in a college game, 40 minutes, he's playing the whole way. And he's named to the All-Big West first team. To this day, Bruce ranks 12th on the Cal State Fullerton Titans point scored list with 1,155 points. And he remains 7th all-time in rebounds with 559. Now after this, it was a long road for Bruce until he finally did make it to the NBA. He would spend the years of 1993 to 1997 bouncing across different leagues across the world, truly. Obviously, he goes undrafted in the NBA draft, if this is the case. Begins his professional career playing for Le Havre, 
that is a French team. France. The V comes before the R. Uh, so he plays that year for Le Havre. And he plays the next season still in the French League. He plays for Evreux. The next year, he does get to come back domestically to the States, but he's not in the NBA yet. No, he's playing in the Continental Basketball Association for the Rockford Lightning. That's a good name. The, the Lightning, I know. I, lo- I love the Rockford Lightning. It reminds me of the Rockford Peaches. I have to imagine it's the same. Uh, is it Rockford, Illinois? Rockford, Illinois. So, oh, indeed, perhaps in a different life, Bruce Bowen and Dottie Hinson would have crossed paths, but not in this life. Uh, in this <laughs> life, he just has a one-year stopgap playing for the Rockford Lightning. After that, it is back to France, where he plays for Besançon. Spends one year with them. And in February of 1997, he does make his final return back stateside, or he does rejoin the Rockford Lightning. He'll finish out that CBA season with them, and he will get a tryout shortly thereafter with the Miami Heat. Bruce makes the team, and in March of 1997, he signs a 10-day contract with the Miami Heat. He makes one appearance for the Heat. He plays one minute. This does not result in a Moonlight Graham stat line. Bruce does register a statistic, and in foreshadowing what he would become best known for, in his one minute, with no shot attempts, and no assists, and no rebounds, he does log one block. This gives him a 36 blocks per 36. Uh, (laughs) That's an elite per 36 (laughs) number. My research, it is the best per 36 for any NBA player in history for blocks. Well, so obviously this season ends with him winning Rookie of the Year. Unfortunately, it doesn't. The one minute Ah. played was not quite enough for him to qualify for Rookie of the Year. But again, the 36 blocks per 36 minutes that he logged for the 96-97 season for the Miami Heat does remain to this day an NBA record. Not officially, though. Just, just Tied, just if nothing else. It, we are a podcast that loves our technicalities, and technically, Bruce Bowen holds that record. Now, we, can, we can make our own statistician group and, and count that as our own. Like Everyone else is doing it. The RTG like reference page. Headed by Bender Benting Rodriguez Jr., we will start the official RTG statistics and let it be known that Bruce Bowen does hold that record for most blocks per 36. And that would be an incredible place to leave the Bruce Bowen story. However, we still have many more places to go. Bruce's next stint, perhaps based on that one minute of playing time, it does land him a contract with the Boston Celtics. In his first full season with the Boston Celtics, Bruce plays 61 games. He starts nine of them. And... As a solid season, he averages 5.6 points, just under three boards, and 1.4 steals in 21 minutes per game, shooting 34% from three, just under 63% from the line. This is uh, looking like it's a chance for Bruce to build some good momentum. It wouldn't work out quite that way. Uh, The next year with the Celtics, uh, he only starts in the one game across 30 games. His minutes drop to 16 per game. His shooting numbers drop across the board. He's only shooting 27% from three. He is shooting 46% from the line. Well, that part's not good. Really not good. Really not good. Uh, and only 2.3 points per game. So not a great 98-99 for Bruce. After that, the Celtics choose not to extend him. But he is picked up by the Philadelphia 76ers. Starts the 99-2000 season with the Sixers. And this is forever immortalized in the fact that if you were to pick up a copy of Kobe Bryant courtside for Nintendo 64, Bruce Bowen is on that Sixers roster. Along with Eric Snow, correct? Along with Eric Snow, along with Aaron McKee. That is my earliest memory of Bruce Bowen is the fact that I was like, oh, who is this random number 12 that has like the lowest rating in the game on the Sixers? Oh, it's Bruce Bowen. So that was my personal first encounter with Mr. Bowen. He wouldn't play a ton of game with the Sixers that year. Uh, he played 42. Only average 
about seven and a half minutes a game. Really just getting in in, you know, mop up duty, very, very rare spots until he would eventually be traded back to that team that got that first glimpse at him for just one minute. Miami Heat. I misspeak. Bruce was not traded to the Miami Heat. Bruce, <laughs> Bruce Bowen was traded to the Chicago Bulls, who immediately waived him, and then he was assigned by the Miami Heat. Racking up those uh, freaking flyer miles. He's racking them up. And, I mean, it's probably a good thing that the Heat Arena at the time was sponsored by America Airlines, right? He's able to get some good miles there. He does adopt in this tenure with the Miami Heat. His number 12, uh, which he would come to be known for with the San Antonio Spurs. But he finishes out this season with the Heat. Maybe it's something about that Miami weather. I don't know what it is. But he does pick it up a little bit thereafter. Uh, Across 21 minutes a game, he averages 5 points a game. 2.2 boards. About a full stock for the uninitiated. Stock is steals plus blocks. He averages 1 stock per game. And 3 fouls per game. Uh, which we'll, we'll speak to something that we'll touch on about Bruce in a little bit. So Bruce finishes out this season with the Heat. They do bring him back for one more after that. He plays the 2000-2001 season with the Heat. And this is where Bruce really starts to establish himself in the NBA. So prior to this, Bruce had started 12 games in his NBA career. That number is going to go way up in 2000-2001. He starts 72 games for the Miami Heat. This is the first team that's really going to give him a chance to establish himself as that defensive presence. And he does well in the role. The aforementioned stock, he averages 1.6 stocks per game. He averages 7.6 points per game. Exactly three rebounds, along with 1.6 assists. Shooting numbers, still not great. Still hanging around that 34% from three, about 61% from the line. And based on this trial run of Bruce Bowen, the starting defensive savant, Greg Popovich had a vision down in San Antonio. He said, I have Tim Duncan, the anchor of my defense and the anchor of my offense. I have this random Argentinian guy that I just drafted. (laughs) He looks pretty cool. He passes pretty fun sometimes. He might be good. I have this French guy who is just adorable as hell and can run my (laughs) offense. What I need is I need something that has been identified in modern terms as a dog. I need a dog. Love Tim Duncan and David Robinson. A team led by Tim Duncan and David Robinson is not led by two dogs. They are both far too pleasant of human beings to be a dog. There's mild amounts of dog. But what we need is somebody that is full-on certified Pitbull, in your face, I'm going to piss you off. We need that dog, and we need that Bruce Bowen. So the Spurs had won the title in 99, but they're lacking for a little bit. So at the age of 30, Bruce Bowen is brought aboard in San Antonio. Starts 59 games, all 59 that he appears in in that first season. Averages the 7 points per game. But the one thing that he starts seeing an uptick in, and modern basketball people will appreciate this, the three-point shot, of course, has become the most efficient shot in basketball. The, the way that people shoot it, the, the percentage at which they shoot it, it's just it's, it's the, the evolution of the game. What Bruce Bowen became the first person to really specialize in is specifically the corner three, or the uninitiated. The standard NBA three-point arc is longer than it is in the corners because, of course, if you were to keep that same length the whole way, you would run out of bounds at a certain point. So they flatten it in the corner. So it is a shorter shot in that corner than it would be from any other point on the three-point arc. This is where Bruce Bowen lives. His first season, he shoots a career-best 37.8 percent from three you don't go all the way this year i believe this year they bowed out to the mavericks i want to say sounds right either mavericks or like a a late rockets run that's definitely when it was the three texas teams all just beating the shit out of each other i think that was that was a year that the lakers beat the nets that year lakers win the title yeah so at any rate they bow out that year but the next year 
Usi is back with a vengeance. And for the 2002-2003 season, he's not going to sell himself short of 59. Bruce starts all 82 games that year. He shoots a career best, 44.1% from three. That would remain the high mark of his career. Still just a 7-1 points per game. Bruce knows what his role is. It's not to score. It's to defend. Averaging the 1.3 stocks per game. With his incredible defense, uh, he is able to help guide the San Antonio Spurs to the second title of their dynasty as they are victorious over those same New Jersey Nets who lost to the Lakers the year before. Head coach of the Nets that year. Would either of you care to guess who that head coach was for the oh, Nets? Oh, God, I do, I do know. Hold on. I don't um, remember at all. I'm not afraid to admit that I don't know. I picture him in my mind's eye and I see him. And he had a second would... career as a tank commander. Just say it. I, 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 it's going to hit me right when you say it. And I'm going to be pissed. Iron Scott. Iron Scott. Iron Scott, who could potentially in another day be a guy. But that's not the guy that we're talking about today. We're talking about Bruce Bowen. Coming back for 04. This was the Lakers' ill fated super team when they added Carl Malone and Gary Payton to Kobe and Shaq. That powerhouse would not be enough to win a title that year, but it was enough to beat the Spurs uh, 4-2 to in the Western Conference semis. It would ultimately lose to the Pistons. The following season, the Pistons and the Spurs would meet up in perhaps the, the most team-oriented finals of all time. Spurs would win that one in seven games, 4-3. to Bruce Bowen providing... Incredible defense on Richard Hamilton, who was the offensive powerhouse of those teams. And as as we know, if we pay attention to the Spurs dynasty, we're going to skip a year the next season. We're not going to focus on 2006. We are going to jump forward to 2007. And we're going to go straight to those NBA finals where the Spurs take on the young upstart one-man powerhouse featuring Eric Snow as the starting point guard. But The second Eric Snow crossover so far. Most famously, led by LeBron James at small forward, Bruce Bowen would be tasked with guarding LeBron James in these 2007 NBA Finals. And when we consider this, again, this is LeBron James. So when I say these numbers, these sound good for any basketball player. But Bruce Bowen held LeBron James 22 points, 7 rebounds, and 6.8 assists Per game in those finals. LeBron shot 20% from three. And 35% from the field. In those finals. Yeah like that's roughly in line with a bad LeBron season. And that's easily the worst he's ever done in the finals. I have to imagine. By far. By far it's the worst he ever did in the finals. And I mean the the number that just jumps out to me. Is the 35% from the field. Because... LeBron's usually easily over 50%. And that's what makes it kind of tough with these defensive players is I read Bruce Bowen statistics. He never averages more than eight points a game in, in a season. His stocks, yeah, he's not a flashy defender. So he's usually around about two stocks. But the fact that he holds LeBron James to those statistics in an NBA Finals across a four-game series where, again, LeBron is supposed to do everything. There's nothing that isn't happening through LeBron. But Bruce Bowen is able to hold him to that. That is as as strong a testament as I think I can offer to the defensive prowess of Bruce Bowen. We had a Kobe stopper last week, and now we have a LeBron stopper. Well, and that's the crazy thing, too, is Bruce had to be a Kobe stopper along the way to all of these championships as well. So he shuts down Kobe. He shuts down Dirk Nowitzki at times. He shuts He's down, shut down Steve Nash, I imagine. Steve Nash when they play on Phoenix. And like that's like the, the, the thing that I just want to emphasize to the defensive prowess of Bruce Bowen. You have these guys that can shut down guards. You have these guys that can shut down bigs. For Bruce Bowen, it was literally just who is the best offensive player regardless of position on this team? Okay, Bruce is going to guard him. So the skills that come into play versus guarding the Steve Nash versus guarding the Kobe versus guarding the Dirk Nowitzki. He did it all, and he shut all of them down. One thing that I would be remiss to mention, we talked a little bit about his asshole streak earlier. and He's a dirty son of a bitch. 
Well, he really is. And, you know, Zaza gets credit for being the person to invent the, the foot slide under the jump shooter. This is a Bruce Bowen move. And the real will recognize that Bruce Bowen is the first person that came up with this. It was not viewed as a foul, really, at first. It wasn't even viewed as a dirty play. But Bruce popularized it so much that it became a dirty play. And it is a dirty play, if we're being real. Putting your foot under a person that's about to land while jumping. But from Bruce's perspective, and this is like, I try to put myself in his head. And as a person that, again, I mentioned, my defensive inspiration came from Bruce Bowen. I never tried to injure people. But I did try to come up with things that would just make you think a half second more than you might otherwise. If you're thinking, if I take this jump shot, Bruce might put his foot under me when I land, you're not going to shoot the same way. And my intention isn't to injure you. My intention is to get you to miss that jump shot. And maybe an increased risk of injury also comes (laughs) along with that. (laughs) My intention is to make you think I'm going to injure you without actually injuring you. That's not a crime. We're, we're, We're just playing mind games here. And Bruce was just playing mind games. He was also playing ankle games. But... That's really what the thought came down to. We go forward. The final season that Bruce would play would be the 2008-2009 season. He finishes that out with the Spurs. Uh, His starts come way, way down in that year. Every single game that he played for the Spurs prior to this season, he started. In the 2009 season, he only starts 10 out of the 80 games that he appears in. Numbers down across the board, only averaging that 2.7 points. Technically, his career does not end with the Spurs. In the following offseason, he would be traded along with Kurt Thomas and Fabricio Oberto to the Milwaukee Bucks for Richard Jefferson. Richard Jefferson was good for the Spurs. Right. I mean, and the fact that, I mean, Kurt Thomas, Fabricio Oberto, Bruce Bowen, neither of them, I don't think, did anything for the Milwaukee Bucks. So just more great work by R.C. Buford and Greg Popovich to turn that around. But... Bruce would take that to be his swan song. He would choose to retire thereafter. Two other notes that I just want to give on Bruce Bowen. He did play for the U.S. national team in 2006. Really? So in the buildup to the, the Redeem team, Mike Krzyzewski is trying to put together his team identity. And he says, you know what we need? A dog. So he goes and gets Bruce Bowen. Bruce Bowen plays for Team USA at the 06 Worlds, uh, the FIBA World Championships in Japan. At 35, he was the oldest player on the team, but he only got spot minutes. And while he would participate in the training camp for the 2008 Redeem team, he ultimately was not named to the squad and would have to watch on the sidelines as Team USA went to win gold in 2008. The other thing worth mentioning with Bruce Bowen, and I'm going to go back to a theme that we mentioned last week. Guy recognizes Guy. In particular, an organization of guys will particularly recognize their Guy. So on March 21st, 2012, Bruce Bowen's number 12 was retired by the San Antonio Spurs. To never be worn again by any San Antonio Spur. Except for two years later, when LaMarcus Aldridge signed, and with Bruce Bowen's permission, LaMarcus Aldridge did wear that number 12 for the San Antonio Spurs. Texas homecoming for LaMarcus. It was a big deal. We rolled out the red carpet. It was like the biggest free agency deal the Spurs had ever made. That was probably a big part of the pitch, honestly. So thank you, Bruce Bowen, for that, helping. That is get so LaMarcus funny, Aldridge. though. It's like, we're going to make a big deal of retiring this number, and then... I mean, hey, no one's wearing it now. I could say safely, there's definitely not a 12 on the Spurs right now. For now. And I mean, and that's why I have that Bruce Bowen number 12 jersey, because I know it will never be donned again. And just in summation, I think that LaMarcus part is a great thing to say for Bruce's legacy, right? And especially as we get back to the theme, we're talking about coattail guys, guys that were along for the ride, guys that knew their role. Bruce Bowen knew what his role was. It was to defend the best player. It was to make the best player think that he might potentially be injured. It was to hit that corner three. It was to allow LaMarcus Aldridge to wear his retired number for the betterment of the organization. It was to be a guy. And I do think that is what Bruce Bowen is. No, Bruce Bowen is one hell of a guy. I feel pretty darn pandered too. 
That was honestly, the, the second that the category was mentioned, two truths reconciled within me. I love Bruce Bowen, and James loves Bruce Bowen. I, I knew I had to go Bruce with Bowen. That. So I, ha- I had to go with that, but I also know that by pandering aside, you're going to bring some heat for us. And we, we've gotten some very slight teasers in the RTG production chat, but I, I just can't wait to hear what direction you choose to go with this, James. Yeah, I felt very certain I didn't have to tell you the sport because there was no way either of you was going to do this sport, or at least not accidentally. Not unknown. Because <laughs> uh, we're going to go back to the Olympics. We're going to talk about a pretty recent Olympian who has participated in a number of Olympics for the United States and has won gold a couple times. Despite this, I bet not only does she remain unknown, her team is probably relatively unknown to you and anyone else that is listening. In fact, of that team, she is probably the biggest outlier. Why don't we go ahead and start this with a, with a pop quiz for the two of you? Okay. How many people are there on a women's eight rowing team 10 you said eight a women's eight rowing team 12 nine is both my response to both of you in german and also the answer there are nine people there are the eight rowers and then there is the coxswain coxswain it is pronounced coxswain you are correct that it is spelled coxswain but no oh, i didn't know that coxswain coxswain okay. coxswain and we're going to be talking about one particular coxswain who helped turn the tide for the United States rowing team, and that's Mary Whipple. Interesting. I hope you explain what a coxswain is, because I'm pretty sure I know, but <laughs> I, it also probably is very important to explain what that is. Oh, I, I assumed that people were not coming in here with an immense amount of crew knowledge. I promise you that. You know, before we talk about that, let's talk a little bit about Mary Rebecca Whipple, who was born in Sacramento on May 10th, 1980. She's born to parents Megan Al. She has a pair of older brothers, Al Jr. and David, so she is either their third or fourth child. I admit I'm not entirely sure, because (laughs) born on that same day is her twin sister, Sarah Janine Whipple. Could not find which one of them was first. So Mary Rebecca and Sarah Janine, those are the Whipple sisters growing up in Sacramento, and a little more than a decade later, as they're entering high school. You know, it's the the Mitch Richmond years with the Kings to kind of set the mood for it all. She's looking for something for her daughters to do. It's like, hey, I'm going to sign you up for a rowing class. And they take to it like duck to water. They start doing singles and pairs, both of them, cooperatively and on their own. Then puberty hits during high school and they don't really grow a whole lot. So the coach comes to Mary. He's like, look, you've got promise. But if you really want to keep with this, you're probably going to have to make the transition coxswain so she is initially disappointed understandably she thinks that becoming a coxswain was like getting demoted but not so let's talk for a moment about the role of a coxswain the two most literal things that they do during a race is one they control the tiller they are the ones steering the boat if you think about a crew race all of the people rowing are not looking where they're going they all have their backs faced to the direction they're pointed only the coxswain can see where they're going so they're in charge of steering They're also in charge of calling out the stroke, keeping pace, just kind of being a motivational force there. They are also kind of like a secondary coach. They're like an equipment manager too. They get a bunch of like clerical roles. They're supposed to be the ones that when the team is like loading and unloading the boat from their setup and all of that, they're the ones that are directing everyone's movement. Also, just to make sure you know, if there's ever a crash, They are legally master of the vessel. That is the term describing their role. Ah. So they do have to be in charge of everyone if there is ever any boat crash. Interesting. Ideally, a coxswain, you might imagine you want them to be pretty small. They have to be minimum 121.5 pounds. Normally, they average around 125. If you weigh less than 121.5 pounds, they do give you bags of sand to get you up to that (laughs) minimum weight. You do just have to kind of sit with bags of sand in your lap. So they want you to get about 125. That is in comparison to the rest of the rowers who all average about six and a quarter inches tall and weigh like 175 to 180 pounds. So every member of your team easily has 50 pounds and about half a foot on you. They all look like the Winklevosses and then just a person carrying sand. It's like the Winklevosses and then a smaller Jesse Eisenberg. (laughs) Like not just Jesse Eisenberg, but a slightly shrunken down version of Jesse Eisenberg. Raisins Um, Jesse Eisenberg. 
The sex of the coxswain does not matter as of 2017 and did not matter at a lot of levels prior to that. You can do it for either team. A man or a woman can cox for the other side. Again, you just want to make sure you're tiny. As you might imagine, it is more common that a female person cocks for a male team rather than the other way around. And just so you know, as I've been saying it, the verb is to cox. Love it. Plural cox verb. Yes, she is coxing and she's coxing quite well at this point as she enters high school. She is at the Sacramento Adventist Academy, Go Capitals. And she's really starting to make a name for herself. She's going to stick with women's rowing. And that's because women's rowing is a beneficiary of a very important piece of legislation. The 92nd United States Congress. It's a heavy hitter. Do you guys have a personal favorite of any of the pieces of legislation they passed? So was, that was Title IX, right? This is the 1972 Congress, essentially. You've got the Clean Water Act, Federal Election Campaign Act, and the Consumer Product Safety Act. Bangers all the way down. But we specifically want to talk about those higher education amendments of 1972, Xavier, one of which is more commonly referred to as Title IX which in simplest terms means that colleges and other schools must have equal athletic opportunities for both men and women. That's 1972. At Yale in 1975, Yale being, you know, a prissy upper crust Ivy League school already had crew teams for both genders. However, the women's team was woefully underfunded, woefully underserved, and they end up suing them at this point following Title IX. They're one of the first big Title IX lawsuits And surprisingly enough, everyone finds in their favor. And Yale is forced to basically set up new accommodations for their women's rowing team. And all the other school presidents and athletic directors look around and they kind of tug at their collars and gulp. uh, Because they realize, oh, the NCAA might actually enforce this. We should probably get some women's programs going. Conveniently, rowing is not only the source of this panic, it's also a pretty easy solution to it. Everyone's like, well, it's a small team, doesn't cost a lot for training or race day equipment. And it's also a pretty easy team to fill because people who are competitive in other sports can take to rowing pretty easily. At the dawn of Title IX, a lot of schools are just figuring we can start this sport of rowing and we'll find a bunch of women who haven't rowed before, but they just are really good athletes and we'll get them into this sport. Before we go much further, I just want to accentuate your point, James. I want to give a shout out to my cousin who I think might listen to this podcast. Kira, if you're listening, Kira was a member of the Florida rowing team. She was a standout goalkeeper for her high school team who was not able to go D1 in soccer, but did go D1 in rowing, much to your same point, James. The only thing is there's still one specific specialized position, and that is the coxswain. Sarah Whipple is someone who had had this whole rowing thing figured out earlier as her passion. And so she did actually get scouted coming into college, which means she gets to go to one of the elite institutions. Now, we already talked about the kind of surprising dynasty in track and field at the University of Nebraska last week. I want to surprise you this week with the fact that the University of Washington Huskies are one of the greatest rowing programs in United States history. That's not a surprise. Lots of water by Seattle. They are already a powerhouse by the time Sarah Whipple gets there. They do not slow down when she gets there. As a freshman, she takes the women's varsity four, not a full eight team, but a four, because the coxswain, of course, can go from team to team. They go all the way to the 1999 national title. And then in 2000, she has now moved up to the eights team, and she takes them to the prestigious London Henley Regatta. This is, in fact, the one that we see the Winklevoss twins in the social network as they are portrayed by Army Hammer compete in. This is only the third year of women participating, and they win the Henley Prize for their victory. It's a huge deal for University of Washington. They come back, get silver in the 2000 NCAA championships that year. She is unsatisfied with that. She decides we got to go back to the finals both of her next two years, junior and senior, and take the gold. So she finishes her college career, having appeared in a national title every single year of her career, and having only finished second once. Pretty good. Pretty good. Graduates with a degree in communications and has a future in international rowing. International rowing has been around for a very long time. In fact, FISA, which is now known as World Rowing, was actually the first international sports federation in 1896 to officially join the Olympic movement, which I think feels like massive Delaware energy. (laughs) Just like, look, we're rowing. We're going to get overshadowed by every other sport eventually. 
but we could be the first federation to get in on this. Everybody remembers their first. Everybody remembers their first. Delaware can forever be the first state. FIS is forever the first one to recognize the Olympics. It's been around since those 1896 Olympics. And then following Title IX, as women's wrong kind of explodes, as early as 1976, it is now a women's event. Women's eights has been there the whole time. The U.S. national team is a small fish in this point. Does get a bronze in that first game. However, other than them getting a gold in 84, which is the Olympics were like all of the Eastern Bloc boycotts, and then Canada getting a gold in 92, this sport is entirely dominated by Central Europe. It's East Germany, later it's unified Germany, Romania comes around in the 2000s, but it's all Eastern and Central Europe. That's when the U.S. is going to begin a new era under coach Tom Turhar. He raced in high school, went to Rutgers, started coaching in Columbia, and then in 1994, becomes an assistant to the U.S. women's national team until he is promoted to head coach in 2001. Just at the same time, Mary Whipple is coming into the picture. So he and Mary Whipple are both kind of entering this program at the same time. And the number one thing they feel like they need to do is address the culture of U.S. rowing. At this time, they were not practicing to the same amount of other nations. They weren't training as often. They didn't have full-time like professional training regimens. He completely institutes all of that. They start doing three a days during the peak season. And another big thing that he does is he makes sure to increase the team and roster flexibility. Everyone on the team can do both sweep rowing and skull rowing. Do either of you want to guess what the difference between the two is? No idea. So sweep sculling is basically you've got both hands on the bar. Skull rowing is when you've got two rows. This is essentially the two different ways that you can race in a larger team or in a smaller one. So everyone now can do either. They can switch from boat to boat. Of course, the biggest thing for a team culture with crew is going to be the coxswain. It's going to be your secondary coach. And Mary Whipple is at the center of all of this. In 2002, they go to the World Championships in Seville, Spain, and Whipple coxes the women's eight to their first gold in any major competition since 1995. They're going to stay on the podium the next year with a top two finish. And then they're going to go to Athens, 2004 Olympics. I will admit, Romania does again win the gold. Boo, Romania. Boo, Romania, but they do get silver. And that is the first medal since that 1984 gold in the women's eights two decades ago. There's no world championship that year. There's never a world championship in years where they have Olympics. The highest competition every year is either world championship or Olympics in crew. In 2005, the world championship's back. They do one more time, finish second in top competition. It's the third straight year that in the top competition, they had finished second, which already is greater than women's rowing had had in decades in the United States. And then at that point, the U.S. women's eight team decides they'd rather never lose another game ever, pretty much. 2006 and 2007, they went back-to-back goals in the World Championships held in England and Germany. 2006, England, 2007, Germany. Okay. So they're going into these, like, parts of the rowing culture in Europe and beating their asses. And then in 2008, we make it to the Beijing Olympics. I'm sure Bruce Bowen, after he doesn't make the team, decides to come watch some women's eight rowing. And if he did, he would have seen that in their first race, they qualify for the finals with the second fastest time of any team in qualifying. Now, in the final, at the very end, the Netherlands makes an insane push. I just want to talk about this for one second. I know we're talking about Mary Whipple, but the Netherlands gains an entire boat length on Romania in just the last 250 meters. They have a photo finish where they edge Romania out by 0.03 seconds. It is insane if you watch the replay to just see this Netherland boat moving. And it is such an incredible effort by them to come in second because the U.S. already crossed the finish line over one and a half seconds ago, y'all. like get Just like top. on Saturday, the Netherlands will finish second to the USA. Absolutely. They're going to get crushed just like everyone did. They are a boat length past the entire field within the first 500 meters. And this is, by the way, a 2,000 meter race, typically taking about six minutes to complete roughly. Like six minutes is, I think, the Olympic record still at this point. The world record will be set by the American women in 2013. That is five minutes and 57 seconds. So they win. They win their gold. It is the first gold for the women in 24 years. 
And Mary Whipple actually decides to take a year off in 2009 after this. She goes to get her master's in intercollegiate athletic leadership from the University of Washington. That's an interesting degree. It's an interesting master's program to kind of like, think about. What, what do you do? At, do you become an AD or? Like... Well, we, she has an interesting post-playing career. Uh, this is just a one-year sabbatical. But again, just a, a testament to how good University of Washington is. The coxswain that fills in for her for the U.S. team during this, obviously the U.S. team wins the world championship again in 2009 because, like, what are we fucking doing here? Of course they do. And Caitlin Snyder is the coxswain who is another former Husky. So the only year that it's not Mary Whipple, it's basically the person that immediately took over for her in college and then kept her seat warm in the professional ranks. 2010, 2011, Whipple returns with her masters. She decides she would like some more gold medals, please. So they do win another two world championships. And that brings us to London 2012, which is expected to be her final Olympic. They finish first in their group, but second over on the qualifiers, very similar to 2008. In the finals, 250 meters into the 2000 meter race, they are just starting to hit their stride at this point. This is right after they've kind of done that first burst of acceleration after everyone sees the green. Something to note, only the rowers can see the light. The coxswain, the only time that they are not the front row to the best action in the entire house is looking for that initial starting sign. The rowers are all trained to go on the sound and sight of that starting sign. And then Mary Whipple just kicks in, screaming at them for six straight minutes. She sees them a quarter length ahead already. Like she's starting to catch up with the back rowers of the other boats as they get to that first quarter mark. Does not slow down from there. As they enter the final 700, this is what she describes. And she'll walk you through these races if you want to look her up on YouTube. Second by second, what's going through her heads. The last 700 meters is the pain portion, as she has called it. That is when all of her teammates, they can be aware of the pain that is building up in their muscles. And she just has to scream them on their way to it. And this is like a five foot nothing, 125 pound waif of a woman. Nothing you against her. You motherfuckers like, keep going. And it's all people again who have 50 pounds on her. She is by far the smallest member of this team of absolutely jacked individuals. Getting them through. It is a slightly closer margin, but they still basically run away with the gold this year. And that ends up being the last major international competition for our girl, Mary Whipple. She is then succeeded by Caitlin Snyder. Caitlin Snyder does not just get that one year. She gets a whole extra run where the U.S. should be said, win three more world championships and the 2016 Olympics to continue the streak until finally in 2017, coming in fourth at the world championships. So now they've won again since then. I would liken the dynasty to like the run that UConn had. And now UConn is still certainly a dominant force in women's college basketball, but it is one of many powerhouses versus like the unstoppable juggernaut. And we got Don Staley. Exactly. Yeah. Now we've got USC, you've got Notre Dame. Romania has come back in women's rowing. England has always been there to some extent because they consider it a very prestigious sports still and germany has never gone away by any means but mary whipple does go away at least from competition she can't stay too far away from the sport though back in 2009 one of the other things she did was she started the ninth seat this is a coaching program specifically aimed at coxswains a coxswain training center it is basically half rowing training and half like motivational speaker slash life coach training Oh, and unsurprisingly, she also does motivational speaking and life coach stuff. Yeah, not surprised. Uh, she married a winter sports instructor named Ryan Murray a few years back. They moved to Leavenworth, Washington and have a couple of kids that are five and two years old. And that's great for her because she was super into winter sports her whole life. She was just like, I can't really do that right now. Got to go be one of the greatest coxswains of all time. Also, as a note, her twin sister, Sarah, did stick with the sport to some extent. She never reached as an individual competitor at the same levels, but she was a coach for colleges for a number of years before settling into coaching a Sacramento area program now that has won a bunch of national titles at the competitive teenage level. Mary Whipple is largely done with competition now. She'll make several ceremonial appearances, but even with the kids that she's coaching, she's not taking them to meets and stuff. She's getting them ready to go join other programs. 
Because what a coxswain has to do is come in and command the team, despite every, if you look at it, first physical reaction you might have to the makeup of the team, indicating the exact opposite. And she did more than win. She helped with Tom Terhar build the foundation of this program that still continued to win without her. So maybe someday she will come out of retirement for that or for skiing. Maybe she'll do a Vanessa May Vanicorn thing. <laughs> but for now, our hall's got cocky guys. Our hall has guys that are dicks. But we have never had a guy that is coxed quite so hard and quite so well as Mary Whipple. And that is my guy for you two today. I really enjoyed that. Did she ever compete in Dadvale? I did look to see if she had made it to our neck of the woods at the old Schuylkill River, and I couldn't find any records for Dadvale. I have to imagine the University of Washington was competing there. It is still to this day like one of the biggest college level competitions internationally. Like other teams from other parts of the world come to Dadvale. Not a lot, but some. So it's a big deal. I'm sure that the Huskies were there at some point while she was crushing it. But unfortunately, I could not find her, her results from Dadvale Regatta. I just love the idea of the position of the coxswain because, like, it's effectively a cheerleader that has actual impact on the game is really, like, what what I think of it. It's the dream of, like, every kid that didn't make the tryouts in high school and then got the equipment manager job or just, like, the sideline hydration assistant, whatever, doing that but still getting an award when the team wins. And also just how, from, from a, like a literal definition of the theme of this week, like we're talking about coattails, we're talking about guys that were along for the ride. That is we're, we're talking about people who had a seat and a view to history. Yeah. And that is yeah. quite literally what the coxswain is. Well, and it sounds like we're starting to discuss the candidates again. And while I'm very happy to hear this early energy for Mary Whipple, we got to give some credit where credit is due to the others. Bruce Bowen's got a lot of, once again, intersections with guys that we've talked about, like Eric Snow, like Anderson Verizhao in those same 2007 finals, like our boy Brent Berry there in San Antonio. Certainly there's crossover there. And I mean, the only guy that isn't one of the two powerhouses with you on, it's an incredible part of a 2010 World Cup team that I have a very personal connection to. This has been a fun one today, but... You literally found someone with a front row seat for greatness. And I can't, it's hard for me to look past that because it is just such a perfect encapsulation of a thing that I did not tell you was how I was thinking about it before two hours ago. As Diaz was saying, we set along for the ride and I did feel like it fit that one pretty well. I was already going for a pun. Don't give me too much credit here. I mean, I, I think we're giving you the exact amount of credit that you deserve, which is just... I, I'm trying to remember what the exact theme was the week that you came up with Diocles. Is that what it was? Gaius Apuleius Diocles? Yes, indeed. Yes. I, like, I mean, Stormcat as a workhorse is probably still to this day my most on-the-nose bit. No, very true, but... The horse that fucks. Everybody loves the horse that fucks. Everybody loves a literal interpretation of a theme and just running with it. I mean... You know, I really thought I had something here with my Bruce Bowen pandering, but I just think this is so on the nose that we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge it. Well, I'm certainly honored, uh, but the honor is not mine to really feel. Diaz, the honors are yours to give, of course. It is my honor to recognize, and it is the honor that will be bestowed upon one of the greatest coxswains one of the greatest persons to cox in the history of sport. We are honored to welcome in from Sacramento, California, Mary Rebecca Whipple. We'll whip her crew into shape and we'll whip our hall into Guy. Welcome into the Hall of Guy, Mary. Rebecca. Dude, I mean, she's, she's going to see the raw material that we have here. And again, you don't need to have a rowing background if you've got a good enough coxswain to get you into shape. We could have, I think, a championship level mixed eight, women's eight, men's eight, whatever you want to run out there. With Mary Whipple at the cox, I trust that we could dominate any rowing competition with our hall. Our cox are in great hands with Mary. <laughs> <laughs> we are in great hands with our cox. You're in great hands with our cox. 
That's about go. five alcoholic beverages deep, Diaz wisdom. It is, it is a proverb. Many people have said this. And we'd like to say to many people, thank you for listening to our silliness once again. It is always a pleasure to have you all on. Thank you to Zach for doing our beautiful theme music. Thank you guys both for joining me this time. Anything else that we should be looking for? What's What country are you more certain than anything will still be in the World Cup when people hear this episode? Brazil. France. Okay. I'm sticking with Argentina. And I've been James. I've been the very special guest, Xavier. And I'm Diaz. And as the great Chicago Cub Ernie Banks once said, the only way to prove you are a good sport is to die. 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 Die.